a lot of people, you know, when they found out that I want to be a lawyer and then that I actually became a lawyer, they just started saying cha-ching, cha-ching, like as if the money was going to roll in. And I'm like, that's not how it works, you know, unless I go to big law. But I don't want to work in big law. I want to work for the everyday man. When I first decided that I was going to switch to teaching, my parents weren't thrilled, but <laughs> it is something that I knew I wanted to do and it was important to me. Knowing that teachers are not very well compensated, I think that definitely pushed me to think about higher education even more. I funded my business via a $500 credit card, a $300 grant, and then I raised $60,000 via a Kickstarter campaign. For the first three years of my business, I lived rent-free at my mother's place and take the little bit of money that I was getting from the business and reinvest it back into it. I've been disabled my entire life, but disability wasn't like a big part of my life. Please stand clear. I wasn't raised to think of myself as being disabled. I wasn't raised to think of whatever limitations I was gonna have out there. It wasn't until I graduated college that I realized, wait a minute, I have to adjust my thinking of the world around me and myself. A lot of us cannot subscribe to the hustle culture that has become our society. And it's not because we're lazy, it's because we're disabled. And that's something that I repeat very often. Disabled, not lazy. My name is Tiara Simmons. I'm 39 years old. I make roughly $26,000 a year and I live in Long Beach, California. I am a law clerk, just turned attorney at a solo practitioner family law firm, and I just launched my own virtual law firm. I was raised as a ward of the court, which means I was not raised by my biological family. My parents struggled with drug addiction and for our best interests, we were removed from the home, but luckily not split up. I was raised by a legal guardian and her sisters. I used prosthetics from K through 12. It was 20 pound prosthetic legs and crutches, and I couldn't carry anything, I couldn't hold anything, I couldn't walk upstairs, they broke often, <laughs> they were painful. I found that for me, it became easier to just use my wheelchair. It opened up the world for me. I can actually get out and not worry about the two inches of snow that just fell or the autumn rains, you know, where I can't get a cab or I'm getting drenched because umbrellas don't work for me. Raincoats don't work for me. I thought California was my best option. So I've been disabled all my life. I wasn't born disabled, but I became disabled before I turned one year old. From what I was told, I had a blood infection and it caused gangrene, blood clotting, and they had to emergency amputate my legs below the knee, both of them, and a couple of my fingers on my right hand. I was clueless about this settlement until right before senior year in high school. When I found out about the settlement money, I don't remember being super excited, like, oh, I have a lot of money, I'm rich now. It was just more so, oh, okay. Only because I wasn't raised to put so much emphasis and value on money the way that I do now as an adult who has none. 
I was able to buy a house by the time I was 17 years old. I was able to travel whenever I wanted to. I had a beautiful apartment, two bedroom, two bathroom in one of the quote unquote luxury buildings with a gym in the heart of downtown Long Beach. Rent, I could just pay. Sometimes I would pay two months in advance just to make sure that I didn't have to worry about anything. You know how when the recession hit, people woke up and they're like, my savings is gone and they didn't know what to do with themselves? That's kind of how I felt when I found out the settlement money was gone. I woke up that morning knowing that I could pay my bills, knowing that I would have no problem paying rent. And by the end of that particular day, I just went into internal panic mode because I didn't work. My husband and I, for the most part, we split the bills. Most of my money goes towards the rent. His money goes towards all of the other bills. But we have a joint account, so really it's just whoever's paycheck hits first is who pays whatever bill needs to get paid. I do have SNAP, but sometimes that runs out or sometimes the case is on hold. So we have to make sure we budget for those types of food emergencies. I take public transportation and I spend maybe 25 to $30 per month on a tap card or a Metro card, they call it, and then just have some cash for the bus. My husband takes Ubers to work. There's no other option, especially because of his hours. We were spending at one point about $250 to $300 per month just for him to get to work. We don't save a lot. There's almost nothing to save. We work, <laughs> we get our paychecks, we save enough for the rent, if that's gonna count as savings, but just to have savings, we don't really have that luxury. <laughs>I do not have student loan debt, but not because I paid it off. It's because I received a total and permanent disability discharge of my student loans. That is only conditional, and it's conditioned on me being at or below the poverty line for the inspection period. If I go above a certain amount of money per year, as far as my income is concerned, then they reinstate all of my student loans, all of them, with the interest attached. It's a rock and a hard place. Like, I can't afford to pay $400,000 in loan, but I also can't afford to not make any money. And, you know, as a law clerk, I already don't make a lot. One day, I want to be able to buy a house. Can't do that if I know that all, of like, $400,000 plus is going to come back. Because then it'll be buy the house or pay the loan. <laughs>
it's just interesting because a lot of people, you know, when they found out that I want to be a lawyer and then that I actually became a lawyer, they just started saying cha-ching, cha-ching, like as if the money was going to roll in. And I'm like, that's not how it works, you know, unless I go to big law. But I don't want to work in big law. I want to work for the everyday man or woman, person. I'm not rolling in the dough right now, and I probably will never <laughs> be rolling in the dough, but I know that, you know, as long as I can survive and as long as I'm doing what I think is my mission in life, I'm okay. Everyone wants more money, but I think that you can live very comfortably off a certain amount of money. And to me personally, I'm not interested in getting the most money as fast as possible and things like that. I feel pretty comfortable with the salary that I'm making now. I think as a teacher, I wasn't making that much anyways to begin with. So I've always been used to kind of being on a budget and it feels very doable for me. My name is Chi Baek. I'm 26 years old. I make $27,000 a year and I live in Seattle, Washington. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington and I'm studying special education. So I decided to take on an extra role as a grader to make some extra money. It pays about $26 an hour and I work about 10 hours a week and basically I'm just grading papers for an undergraduate class. I was born in Seoul, Korea, but I moved to Silver Spring, Maryland when I was four years old and I grew up there. When I first decided that I was going to switch to teaching, my parents weren't thrilled, but <laughs> it is something that I knew I wanted to do and it was important to me. But knowing that, knowing that teachers are not very well compensated, I think that definitely pushed me to think about higher education even more and pursuing higher goals. I've always kind of known I wanted to do higher education, but it definitely was honestly very difficult teaching during COVID. And I thought that I could use a little break from it. So I decided to pursue my doctorate earlier than I thought. Education was always really highly valued in my family. And also personally, I just like school, I'm kind of a nerd. Growing up, my family did struggle with money a little bit and they definitely were savers and we saved a lot. And seeing that, I think I kind of went the opposite direction of like when I have my own money, I want to buy myself some things that I want because I didn't necessarily get everything I wanted as a kid, which is probably good. But <laughs> I think when I got older, I definitely was like, I'm earning this money. I deserve to buy myself nice things. And that kind of shaped how I view money. I do not like to cook, but because of my budget, I've been doing HelloFresh meals. And I know that's a little bit more expensive than me going to the grocery store, buying my own groceries and cooking. But because I feel like I don't have that skill set, the HelloFresh meals, I think definitely are worth the money in my budget. In terms of eating out, I definitely eat out a lot less than I did back home. I think that life is short and we should enjoy it. I know that I could be a little bit more responsible with my money, but I do think that I'm not irresponsible with my money and I believe in getting myself things that I want from time to time, for sure. My splurges are definitely like makeup, skincare, nails. Perfumes is a really big one for me that I probably spend a little bit too much on. But it's something that makes me happy and I think it's worth it. So right now I'm not really saving any of the money that I'm getting. I do have some credit card debt.
I don't have a car here in Seattle and that's definitely been a big adjustment for me. I do try to take the light rail as much as possible, which is like the train system here, but I've definitely spent a lot more on Ubers and like rideshare things than I've wanted to. <laughs> Therapy is an important expense for me. I grew up in an environment where I think there was a lot of pressure and that definitely has affected me. As I've gotten older, I think I've seen more about how it's affected me. My dad is a jeweler and my mom has always stayed at home. And my brother is some sort of business consultant. I'm close to my family in a traditionally Asian way. <laughs> I help my parents with little things like paying traffic bills and stuff online that they can't do on their own. If they ever need to call like the electric company or things like that and they need help with translation, I help them with that. Watching how my parents handle money made me careful with my money. I never really saw them like invest their money or anything like that. So I don't really know how to do anything like that. And I do rely heavily on my brother for that sort of advice. And I think he kind of learned on his own. I have almost $70,000 saved in my retirement accounts because on the advice of my brother mostly, when I was teaching, I put about 30% of my income into my retirement. And that was across the four years I was a teacher. My brother is very, very generous. It's a very informal agreement. I owe him probably around $15,000, which is a good sum of money, but it's kind of under the agreement of when I have that money, I'll pay him back. I think culturally and the way we grew up, it was always kind of known like you help each other out. During the four years of my PhD, I do expect to make around the same amount of money. There are opportunities for me to apply for more funding, but that would require more work and I feel like my workload is pretty heavy as is, so I think it'll stay the same. <laughs> I think when I first graduate, I definitely still do wanna work with people, so maybe some sort of director role in a school system, but eventually I do see myself in academia doing research. My big picture financial goals, once I graduate school, would be to get a decently paying job, start paying my brother back, and start saving my own money you know, my regular savings account and definitely add to my retirement some more too. I think I will still continue to kind of live the way I'm living now, money philosophy wise, like still treating myself. I do hope that I will be responsible once I do start making a little bit more money. You hear $27,000 and you're like, that's so little money, but it is very doable and I feel very grateful that I'm making that much. Growing up in Dominican culture, the first thing your mom does in the morning is brew coffee. In the countryside of Dominican Republic, we farm, we harvest, we roast coffee. And it's one of those things that when I came to America, to New York City, I didn't see that Dominican coffee representation that I saw with Brazilian, Colombian, Costa Rican coffees, Ethiopian coffees. I just wanted to create awareness to Dominican coffee. I wanted people to try it. I wanted people to tell you, oh, this is a great cup of coffee from the Dominican Republic. It's not just a great country for a vacation. We have good coffee too. <laughs> My name is Hector Carverhall. I am 26 years old and I make $25,000 a year. I am the founder of Don Carver Hall Cafe, a coffee roasting business that I started in 2019. Between the Dominican Republic and the Bronx, I saw a lot of people grinding and hustling, and I feel like that's what instilled the entrepreneurial spirit within me. Mm -hmm. 
The first job my mom had when she came to America was cleaning tables at McDonald's and my dad was a cab driver. So resources were scarce and we didn't really have much money to work with. Thankfully, we made it happen, and thanks to their resilience and their hard work and their honesty, I am that type of person now that carries those values and I'm able to carry out my craft, I'm able to chase my dreams. All right. In 2018, I studied business with a concentration in marketing at the University of Rochester, and I had a class where I had to create a business plan and a marketing plan for the term. And the first thing that I thought about was coffee, specifically Dominican coffee, and how it's now properly represented in the United States market. This is a photo of my grandfather in the Dominican Republic in 1986. This is where I get the inspiration for my brand, for the logo and the organic feel and everything that you see that we put across. I funded my business via a $500 credit card, a $300 grant, and then I raised $60,000 via a Kickstarter campaign. For the first three years of my business, I lived rent-free at my mother's place. When I came back from college, I really didn't see myself succeeding. Thanks to her, I was able to save money and take the little bit of money that I was getting from the business and reinvest it back into it. Not growing up with much, I learned that you don't need much to survive. You need a roof over your head, you need food, and some of the necessities. Making 25K a year, I just make it work. And that's the same way my mother made it work. I am more than just fine with 25K for now. A lot of the expenses, like the car, the car insurance, the maintenance, the gas, are all a company expense since it's a company vehicle. My cell phone bill is also another business expense because I use it to call, text for work, make content and stuff like that. My apartment's rent is 2,700 a month. And then when you include utilities and little things in between, it comes out to about three grand a month. And then me and my girlfriend split it down the middle and my portion is 1,500. Majority of the stuff that we consume at home, I barter and trade at the farmer's market. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, I appreciate that. So they have a lot of great options from the local community, from greens to veggies, fish, cheese, and all these other things that I get to trade for a cup of coffee or a bag. I have free health insurance coverage in the state of New York based on my income bracket via Medicaid. I don't currently have any credit card debt. If I do use my credit card, I pay it the same month. And uh, the only debt I have to my name is student loans, which got forgiven, but I'm waiting for it to really be processed with the new thing that Biden has going on. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't really save much money. And it's just because I decided to try to put together some money to see if I want to invest it into another business, like vending machines or like a new little venture to kind of diversify my assets. As the owner and operator of Don Carvajal Cafe, I typically start my week by checking my email, checking our online orders. Then I make my way to New Jersey where I pick up the raw green beans at the warehouses where they store most of the green coffee in the East Coast. We're at Continental Terminals in New Jersey, one of the biggest raw green coffee warehouses in the East Coast. This is where I get some of my green coffee. I am picking up Dominican coffee today. A lot of big players like Starbucks and Dunkin' and other local coffee roasters come and pick up their coffee from here. And uh, yeah, let's get right to it. Yeah, un saco de café dominicano. This is where it all goes down. So we got a bunch of different coffees. Got Colombian, Brazilian, Honduran coffee right here. It's all basically different lots or different farms. It's mucho coffee. Green coffee. Gracias. We're currently at a co-shared roasting facility where I bring my raw green coffee and grind, literally and figuratively. So as you can see, we have green coffee, we have the roaster. This is a lowering right here, industrial sized coffee roaster. It costs about just a hundred racks. So you see the green beans, you see the roaster. This is where it all goes down.
My go-to cup of coffee is really just a pour over or a black drip. I just enjoy coffee for what it is. Like, I don't judge, I don't critique. I just wanna try you for who you are. I'm not putting sugar, I'm not putting milk. I just wanna have it for what it is. And that's how I like humans. I'm like, listen, just be yourself and give the world who you are and what you are and just be genuine. My goal in the next five years for my business is to really expand its retail presence, its wholesale presence. I would love to be in more retailers like Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, big chains, because I just want people to try Dominican coffee. I want you to get familiar with it. I want it to reach more states. I want it to go further than New York. I want it to go past the Bronx. I have my mother who I would love to take care of in any way, shape, or capacity. If anything happens, I wanna make sure I take care of her financially for all the good stuff she has done for me to be here today and potentially invest into other businesses and entertain other ideas that I might have. But I wanna make sure the business is running itself and that I can invest my time and energy into other things.